Well, welcome, welcome. I'm Andre Churchwell, Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at Vanderbilt University and Chief Diversity Officer for Vanderbilt University. I welcome you to a follow-up discussion of our COVID webinar that we did last year in conjunction with our sister SEC schools and their Chief Diversity Officers. We examined almost a year ago, and in the midst of a growing pandemic, some of the similarities around the COVID pandemic that we face in our different schools in our different populations that were evident at that time. Today, I thought it would be useful to do an update and examine lessons learned about health equity from the pandemic and to share our plans we put in place and had to pivot to and do it through the lens of our own hometown, Nashville, Tennessee. Today, I'm thankful to have a number of colleagues and friends who are notable health and healthcare experts and leaders. First off, Dr. Consuelo Wilkins, the newly minted Senior Vice President and Senior Associate Dean for Health Equity and Inclusive Excellence, who's also your Associate Dean at Vanderbilt and Professor of Medicine. I need to stop reading her CV, otherwise I'll spend the next hour. I'll move on to James Hildreth, great friend and colleague, President and Chief Executive Officer of Meharry Medical College, and even more importantly for this particular meeting, an internationally known and Oxford-educated immunologist who pivoted to virology during the time of HIV and, and the terrible infestation that, that affected the country then. And Jim is a spectacular expert on vir virology. And he'll share some insights on that with respect to COVID. And lastly, my good friend and colleague of so many years uh, that we won't count today, Dr. and Senator Bill Friss, former Senator, but more importantly, founder and director of the Vanderbilt Multi-Organ Transplant Center, and now founder and chairman of Nashville Health and a major leader in force here in national and across the country and globally for health and, and, and also healthcare outcomes. Now we'll spend some time today on lessons learned for COVID. Uh, I'd like to also focus on issues on racial and health inequities and disparities that are present in our hometown. We'll begin though with the COVID update and think about and to share lessons learned uh, for our Nashville and hometown. And we are certainly thankful to have Jim Hildreth here. And Jim, I'd like to ask you to, if you could share what you've done so many times in public forums, what is the difference between COVID-19 as a virus and the typical flu virus? And also share with our, uh, our audience, what is an mRNA vaccine and how is that different or better than the, you know, than the traditional vaccine that we use for flu? You're, you're a mute, you're muted Jim. <laughs> Uh, yeah. All this time I would have that down pat, but so thank you, Dr. Churchwell. I'm happy to offer some thoughts about the, the virus. First of all, COVID-19 is caused by a virus that's been designated SARS-CoV-2 because it's so closely related to SARS, the virus that caused the pandemic in 2003. One of the main differences between that RNA virus and SARS-CoV-2 is that for SARS, there was an animal vector probably privets. So you can only get infected by coming into contact with those animals. The SARS-CoV-2, we became the vectors for this virus. So humans are spreading it to each other. And because of the, the ease of international travel and how mobile people are, the virus quickly spread around the globe. And the other thing that's very significant about this virus is that it's an airborne pathogen, which means without coughing, sneezing, yelling, or having a loud conversation, the virus can be passed from one person to another. And that's been one of the major challenges in controlling the virus. And it took a long time for this to be accepted, but this is truly an airborne pathogen. And that's one of the major uh, um, challenges that we have. Now, thankfully, there have been decades and decades of research on RNA viruses. And people know some of these viruses. Influenza is an RNA virus. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus. HIV is an RNA virus. So decades and decades of research on those other viruses made it more practical and easy for scientists studying uh, SARS-CoV-2 to make progress. And let me just say that from my point of view as someone who studied viruses for 40 years, it's been a breathtaking thing to watch the vaccine being developed in really about less than a year. That normally takes at least four years. And let me just share three major reasons, and I'll stop talking, why we were able to do it in such a short time. The first is technology. The technologies brought to bear on COVID-19 are unlike any that we've seen in a really long time. We've never seen them before. And one example is 
the genomic sequence for the virus was published in early January of 2020. A month later, three companies that I'm aware of had already identified a vaccine candidate. That process normally takes a year or longer. So technology is one thing. The next one is parallel processes. Vaccine development is normally an iterative process. You, you do one step, you follow that by another step, you follow it by another step. The resources were made available to the pharmaceutical companies to do these steps in parallel. So having parallel processes compress the time frame. And the third thing, which is relevant to my own work is, we've been trying to develop an HIV vaccine since the mid eighties. We don't have one. What we do have is an amazing global infrastructure for HIV vaccine development. And last February, the HIV vaccine infrastructure paused, pivoted and focused its full attention on COVID-19. So the combination of technologies, parallel processes and an existing infrastructure allowed the scientists to do something in less than a year that had normally taken at least four years, which is the fastest vaccine that we know of, and that was Ebola. So as a scientist myself and a virologist and immunologist, I'm so excited that science delivered. The only thing that could solve this problem was science and science delivered big time. And as a scientist myself, that makes me very proud. So. Good stuff, Jim. One question I get stopped and asked by folks on the street is, what is the difference in a message RNA vaccine versus the traditional one that we go to the doctor's office for years to get? Can you help them understand that? So, so it is true that for vaccines, messenger RNA is a new platform, but it's not a new technology. mRNA was discovered in 1961 and studies in humans have been going on for, for at least a decade or, or so. Uh, and mRNAs are the working blueprints for our proteins. The permanent blueprints for our proteins are found in our DNA locked inside our cells and nuclei. But the working blueprints are these short stretches of RNA and they allow the machinery in our cells to make proteins. What the pharmaceutical companies did was they took a messenger RNA that encodes a spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and that's being delivered inside of our cells. Our cells are then making that viral protein just like they make our normal proteins. That gets expressed, our immune system sees it and we make a response to it. So mRNA is a new technology, relatively new for vaccines, but it's not a new technology in terms of medical research. We've been, we've, we've known about mRNA since 1961. And so people need to know that there's a lot known about them. And the other thing I would say, and I'll shut up is, <laughs> mRNAs only live in our cells for a very short time. In fact, some of them only are present for minutes. The drug companies designed the mRNAs for the vaccines to be around for about 24 hours or so to maximize protein expression. But after that, they get destroyed. So the likelihood of long-term effects from the mRNA are minimized by the fact that they're so short-lived and they cannot modify our DNA. That's the other thing that people need to know. That's great. That really helps dispel a lot of concerns that uh, people have. You know, March 6th was an important day, uh, Consuelo, because that's when the first case was reported here in the state of Tennessee. We're sitting there watching the globe spin in this pandemic sweep from east uh, to west to Washington State to the northeast. And now here we are sitting here in Nashville knowing it's coming. Jim knows it's coming. Bill knows it's coming. You know it's coming. I do. And March 6th, it hits. And the city had to pivot and do stuff. Uh, talk to us about how to sit, how system, you have a paper about that. How did we have to pivot and change and kind of what did we do and how did we connect with the various components of Nashville's healthcare? Yeah, so important that during this pandemic, we needed to learn how to be more nimble and adapt and adjust. And, and as you just mentioned, pivot. So uh, all of a sudden we we're focusing all, pretty much all of our attention on this one huge issue that has so many uh, relevant direct and indirect uh, consequences. So, you know, I, I think perhaps thinking about lessons learned, focusing on uh, what we learned about how we needed to be prepared to uh, prepare for these populations who early on, it was very clear and perhaps not surprising that um, groups that have been marginalized, minoritized, were experiencing uh, the pandemic very differently. So 
uh, African American, Hispanic, Latino, uh, Native, Indigenous people, um, people with limited English proficiency were much more likely to um, to present uh, and need to be hospitalized, the outcomes were worse. And we're hearing this all over the country. And I, I think certainly uh, with uh, Meharry Medical College being in town and, and, and so much uh, depth focused on, on health disparities there is it tremendous for our broader Nashville community uh, and, and thinking about how we actually pivot um, internally at an institution like Vanderbilt University Medical Center um, to, to really think through how to prevent, mitigate, and address these disparities. Uh, fortunately, we were thinking about that early on. Uh, we, we, we knew about what we were seeing in uh, New York and, uh, and Seattle and even in other countries um, that, that we needed to prioritize this. So um, as, a, as a health system, you know, we were, I think, fortunate to, to try and embed health equity leaders, the health equity lens into our command center. So at the center of our operations, um, I was there, you as well, uh, individuals on our team who have expertise in knowing how to uh, examine policies and practices with this health equity lens was really very important. And, and I'll share from the paper um, you mentioned, uh, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst, um, uh, at the beginning of this year, we, we outlined how systems need to be um, prepared to address inequities. So five key points there. Um, one is that you know, we cannot wait until the pandemic happens. You have to have infrastructure in place. You need to have invested in some way. Uh, and my Office of Health Equity, which was established two years ago uh, with institutional funds and people supporting it uh, was really uh, very important uh, in how we actually were able to engage internally and externally. Uh, number two is you have to have health equity related goals. You have to be intentional. We intend to make sure that there are not differences in outcomes for these populations. Uh, and that has to be um, you know, really disseminated, thought about uh, and strategies put in place for achieving those goals. Um, I know Senator Frist is going to talk about data, uh, but you know, data, data, data is so important. Uh, we heard this around the country as well. We like to talk about real data, that's race, ethnicity, and language. Uh, so you can't even identify these, um, these disparities, these inequities, if you're not able to disaggregate the data by these key demographics. So we prioritize collection of race, ethnicity, and language. And we also brought in social determinants of health data. So uh, we, we knew early on that we could pinpoint places in the community uh, with specific demographics and specific zip codes. We knew uh, the, uh, the percentage of those populations who spoke languages other than English. So being able to pull all that data in uh, and share it, I think is really important. Um, in that command center I mentioned, uh, it wasn't just clinicians, there, you know, the, the head of operations, finance folks, the individuals who are responsible for securing the ventilators and the PPE, um, the communications team, everybody was at that table. Uh, and it was really important for us to be able to communicate how these um, certain decisions would impact those populations who were experiencing uh, disparities. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is a, a lesson that we already knew, but needed to, you know, certainly uh, amplifying it that uh, this is not the kind of um, health issue concern that just impacts a system alone. Uh, you have to be able to communicate uh, effectively with other health systems, with the public health sector, but also with community partners, community organizations, people who are closely connected with these communities, who are already trusted agents in those, uh, in those communities. Uh, and, and we need to do a better job of that, I think, long-term, uh, keeping these lines of communication open, but also valuing the different assets, uh, resources, and connections that people bring to the table. Great, thanks. You know, I, I look at this whole discussion as kind of a real-time review. It's almost like a time tunnel as we look at this thing as events occurred across the city. Before we get to Bill, 
on some specifics about racial health and inequities. I'm going to come back to pivot back to uh, to Jim because as the data came rolling out, Jim, we had to recognize we needed to do more screening in the African American community because we knew that information coming in from the Northeast, right? Can can, can you share that with us? Uh, yes, Dr. Churchwell. Uh, I mean. I think we at Meharry understand that we are a trusted organization and certainly, certainly among minoritized communities. And we felt compelled to make sure that testing would be available to those communities. So we had our uh, testing site set up to go in like mid-March or so late March. But we like others found that we couldn't get supplies for <laughs> to, to, to get it done. So my team started working with the mayor's office and as it turned out, the logistics we worked up were pretty good. So the mayor asked us to become the test, take over the testing for the city. So as a result, we started running the three testing sites for the city and did over a million tests, I think at last count for the city of Nashville. But our, our motivation was just, as you said, to make sure that everyone in the city, regardless of whether they were on the patient panels of the large systems or not. And uh, I think all of us had a role to play we were just proud to be a part of a healthcare ecosystem that showed its value in a pandemic. I mean, it was really amazing to watch the cooperation between, you know, Vanderbilt, HCA, uh, Ascension. It was just wonderful to see. And I think that Nashville is a model for the rest of the nation and how we all came together. And no we're question just, about it. No question. I felt very reassured seeing you on MSNBC every night too, Jim. <laughs> yeah. You know, so a, a great way to pivot to Bill Friss, it, it was teed up by, by Jim and Consuelo around the social determinants of health. And we need probably, uh, Bill, a lot of folks don't, some folks on this call watching this may not know what that means. So if you could share that in the context now, we know COVID shown the spotlight on health disparities that were already extant and present in our minority communities. We know that all of us working in this space, the prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, predominance, and the, and the, and, and the chronic or acute psychosocial issues that African-Americans have that lead to that chronic inflammation, acute inflammation, and rise in susceptibility to COVID, to diabetes, to cardiovascular disease. We have that in Nashville. It's endemic in Nashville. And you've got some data to share with us about that, but could you share a little bit about what are the social determinants of health? And, yeah. and you can hear that, Bill. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Andre, and, and it's real honored to be uh, on the panel uh, today. Uh, first, the social determinants. Um, the social determinants, I don't even like the term very much because it, it has all sorts of connotations and it's sort of a wastebasket and people say it and they don't really know what they mean. So I generally say the non-medical determinants of well-being, of health. And by that, we mean that the, the, the clinician, the, the Dr. Frist uh, patient interactions important, but the outcome of, of the patient's journey to well being and health, physical health, mental health, um, uh, spiritual health, psychological health, the greater well being is mostly, mostly determined by those non medical determinants. And it might be socio socioeconomic. It might be things like access to the internet. We frequently think of housing. We frequently think of food, of a person's zip code, one of the major determinants of outcomes uh, uh, today. Secondly, and, and the, the number three uh, on, on Cotswell's list of, of, of data is really interesting. And I'll, I'll use this to transition a little bit to the equity issues that really feed into the social determinants in so many ways. Why we have to take a more holistic view of health and well-being. Why it's not just a doctor's responsibility, but it's a community responsibility. It's a state, it's a city, it's, it's a metropolitan uh, area. It's a national responsibility. And it really goes back to data, data, uh, data. We see these national statistics in, in surveys um, about health inequities and disparities. And, and all of us have seen those over the last 20 years, these national surveys. And in Washington, I wrote uh, much of the legislation around healthcare disturb, um, uh, disparities with people like um, those of you on the panel, but uh, David Satcher and others uh, over time. And they're dramatic and telling surveys that are out there. But at the end of the day, a lot of people locally, say around us right now in, in Nashville, say, yes, but that's New York City or that's San Francisco. And that data doesn't apply to us. 
So last year, uh, working with people on this panel, a, a local collaborative called Nashville Health, which brings people together addressing the sort of issues we're talking about, published the facts that are, are from right here at home, data that was generated by respondents all over the city, not just from West Nashville or South Nashville or North, but the entire city, a representative comprehensive survey. It comes back to Consuelo's data, 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 because it, it, you can't argue with the data itself. That survey was uh, sponsored by Nashville Health, which is the collaborative, and the Metropolitan uh, Public Health Department, which has played a major role in all of our lives. Uh, over history, but really over the last two years. That survey was called the Nashville Health Community Health and Wellbeing Survey. What's remarkable is that it was the first survey of its kind, look at health and well-being in Nashville, Tennessee, Davidson County, the surrounding counties in more than 20 years. I use all that because I know people are listening to this webinar all over the country today. And I do encourage all of you to go back and look locally what are the findings. So the pandemic we point to, it's, it, it's shown this light on the inequities, the racial inequities, the social, eco, social economic inequities that are out there. But some of those findings and many of those findings were already pre-existing. Things, let me just give you some examples. Uh, that survey that, 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 that is just released last year and that you and I, Andre, wrote about, and some of it was reported in the, in the Nashville Tennessean or the Tennessean. Number one, African-Americans are five times more likely in Nashville to report feeling discrimination when seeking health care in Nashville here, five times more. Uh, that, that's what our respondents tell us, statistically uh, documented uh, carefully. Uh, number two, if you look at just uh, the workplace generally, right here at home in Nashville, nearly one in three African-Americans felt discriminated against at work over the preceding 12 months. This is the 12 months right before the pandemic, not caused by the pandemic. And that is five times greater than, than white respondents in the survey. Mm -hmm. Another one is about healthcare treatment. Is there discrimination in the workplace? Well, you can argue there, you know, there's no doctor or nurse, as we said in our article, that goes to work every day saying that they're going to discriminate or want to. Mm -hmm. But what, are, what do respondents say on discrimination in, in healthcare treatment? One third of African American respondents here in Nashville reported feeling emotionally upset, that's angry, sad, or, or frustrated, in response to treatment based on race. Only 7% of white survey takers said similarly, one third versus 7%. That means that there's a fourfold greater likelihood here in Nashville that African-Americans will be emotionally distraught or upset, some negative reaction when told in that clinical office of a diagnosis or of receiving treatment. The data is important, but the, the question that, it, that, that, it, that is so important for us to discuss, and now just like in this panel we're discussing it is, okay, that's the data, but why is this? Uh, is it because of the way the diagnosis or treatment is communicated or delivered by the system itself or by the individuals? Um, how should the description of, of treatment be framed? Is it cultural? Is there a cultural insensitivity, not on purpose, but part of the system itself? How much time was spent in explanation with the populations? I don't have those answers, but the point is looking at data, collecting that data, coming to Consuelo's third point and getting the data, these are the sort of things that, that must be, be uh, explored. I'll, I'll just finish by, by these social supports and um, non-medical supports in our healthcare system today. When somebody comes into the system, when we talk about the non-medical determinants or social determinants, because we also had questions on that in the survey. The bottom line is that our national communities of color disproportionately feel unsupported compared to other populations. The example is in the data in the survey and responding to the survey, 8% of white respondents say they rarely get needed social support when receiving care. But twice that, or 15% of African-Americans reported that they rarely or never get that needed support, twice of that. And if you look at, it's not just African-Americans, I've been using that as an example, but Hispanics and Latinos, uh, for that particular question, for example, the data is even more discouraging a startling 23% of Hispanic respondents shared the same sentiment. 
remember compared to, I think it was 7.8% of white respondents said the same. So I'll stop with that. Just I wanna underscore the importance in all of these issues of inequity and we can come back to the diversity and inclusion, especially in a town that's growing as fast as Nashville is, is today. We need to example to examine. It is right here at home. We've known for the last 20 years, as I mentioned, of these disparities, of these inequities based on, on it may be color of skin, it may be socioeconomic, it may be where we live. In fact, I'll close with this, the National Academy of Medicine landmark report 18 years ago, it was 2003, and it was called Unequal Treatment. And in that report, it demonstrated exactly what our data does today. We haven't made much progress, but for the country, where it demonstrated that across virtually every therapy out there, every therapeutic intervention out there, that minorities, including African-Americans, receive poor quality care when you compare them to whites. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Bill. Wow. Uh, and to put it in very stark terms, if you go from Bellmead Boulevard to down to Buchanan Street, there may be an eight to 10 year lifetime survival difference. Uh, if you're a man, African-American man, you might make it to 70 or 71 here. Uh, and to be honest with you, in following that data from the National Center of Health Statistics, we just got over age 69, Jim, just the last couple of years when the data was reported. It was, we were stuck at 69 for years. And for African-American women, the differences aren't quite as great between that and their white counterparts, but there's still a difference. The men are definitely huge disparity seen there. I think it's really relevant now to bring in some of the other things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'd like to ask uh, Jim and Consuelo to talk about racism in all of its forms. Uh, Bill talked about it. Let's just lay it out there. We know about unconscious bias. We certainly know that, but we know there's personal racism, interpersonal racism, structural race, institutional racism that's present in our institutions, in our cities, in our healthcare systems that we need to address. How much of that is playing a role in terms of these big disparities in lifetime survival? Can you guys address that a little bit? Bill, you can jump in too, but I'll move it to uh, Jim, Jim and I just want to point people to the work of one of my colleagues at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, Dr. David Williams. Dr. Williams was the first to provide objective, truly objective evidence that racism can, can have an impact on health. And there are really four easy to measure parameters that demonstrate this quite, uh, quite nicely. Lower life expectancy, as you just mentioned, high blood pressure, lower rates of vaccinations, and our mental health. All of those things can be objectively documented to be negatively impacted by by racism. And the other thing, as, as Dr. Friss pointed out, we've known for a long time that if you're black or brown and you go to a physician, even if you have the same job, same income, same zip code, same everything, you're less likely to get the most up-to-date aggressive treatment plan than someone who is white. We've known that for a really long time. So even if you do have access to healthcare, which many brown and black people don't, you're still not likely to get the same level of attention and care as someone who is in a majority population. And let me also add that um, this is a major concern for long COVID or PASC as we call it, because long COVID involves these, these symptoms that are not easily measured by objective means. Fatigue, headaches, you know, uh, lethargy, all these things. And as you know, even for women, this is a problem because women who have chronic fatigue syndrome often are dismissed by the people who are treating them. So we're very concerned and I'm on the health equity task force for the president. And we're now dealing with how do we make sure that minorities who are suffering from long COVID will get the care that they need knowing that this bias exists. So it's, it's a real problem. And we're trying to make recommendations to, uh, to the president and HRSA to make sure that we can find solutions for it. But it's a real problem. Th thanks, Jeff. Consuelo, uh, comments? It's uh, so important to acknowledge that uh, structural or systemic racism um, is playing a role in these outcomes that we're seeing. Uh, and, um, and, and thanks, uh, Dr. Hildreth, for bringing up um, uh, Dr. David Williams. So for those of you who are not familiar with his work, certainly uh, an important body of work um, including, you know, um, I, I, I always want to uh, emphasize measurement uh, 
uh, at, you know, Dr. Williams has a, uh, a couple of different scales. One is, you know, everyday uh, discrimination scale so that uh, if we're not able to actually look at these data um, and show the links, then we'll keep fooling ourselves that, that these are not actually, these things are not actually happening. So, uh, and, and I'm really delighted that uh, as Senator, Senator Friss pointed out, these, um, the survey of, of well-being asked about uh, racism and discrimination, asked about discrimination, they're able to look at it by race. So, you know, we're not able to actually act if we don't collect the data. And so that's so important. But um, to the point of, you know, systemic and structural racism, I, I do think it's important for us to, to recognize that when we're talking about structural racism, uh, I think about systemic, you know, for, for there are four levels of racism that we often think, talk about, um, this internalized, interpersonal, institutional, and then structural. Uh, and depending on, you know, who, whose work you're looking at, sometimes those labels change, but the systemic is really in that institutional level and, and structural level. Um, and structure is about policy. So embedded in our policies um, across um, across the country um, ha is racism. So, uh, and you can see it very clearly here in Nashville. Uh, if you look at uh, the parts of Nashville uh, where there was redlining, where um, uh, African-Americans, people, uh, black people were not able to get loans or buy, buy homes, you can go and find out where the, um, the higher prevalences, incidences of COVID were. You can just pull up that map and you can, you can track it to there where there is more crowding in housing, um, fewer resources, more food deserts, more food, more, more food swamps, more people are actually working, but they're making less money. So you can actually track all of those things to policies that have been, uh, you know, that, that, that have been built on bias. And so in that setting, uh, you can have no, you can have people who are there who don't intend to be biased, discriminate, or be racist, uh, but the policies are continuing um, to um, disadvantage people because that's how they, they were set up. And so, um, you know, very clearly, you know, we talked so much about COVID uh, and early on people were, were trying to, you know, link these disparities to um, uh, biological differences. And I think that's where where we start to um, we start to get confused because uh, racism, uh, poverty, um, living in disadvantaged backgrounds and in, in, in live disadvantaged environments, uh, there is a biopsychosocial response. Your your body physiologically changes. Um, you are more more likely to to get an infection of some kind. Your um, body doesn't handle glucose the same way. So this, um, these uh, things that we see, diabetes, hypertension, increased risk of uh, COVID-19 and other things are not because of race or ethnicity. They're because of this uh, complex biopsychosocial, social, physiological response to an environment that is uh, really detrimental. And so I think, uh, you know, this is such an important time for us to continue to do research in, in this area and really um, show the link more clearly, um, but also to think about the policies that need to change uh, in order to address this. One thing you've touched on, great, great responses, guys, but uh, one thing you've touched on, I think it's important for people to know, and you've hit it, but I want you to come back again, Consuelo, is there's always the concern in the community about what's more important, the genetics or the environment? And I think this is, you're exactly addressing it. The chronic stress model, clearly the environment's 80% of disease expression or more. I mean, we actually have the data to, to back that up. So can, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I, I do think that uh, part of the challenge is that we have linked genetics um, and ancestry to race and ethnicity um, for so long that it's really hard to disentangle that. So if we accept that race is a, is a social construct, that I as a black woman uh, can have one black great grandparent or eight black great grandparents and still be considered black. 
So as my social identity, um, th think about the, the links to ancestry if you have uh, seven non-Black uh, great-grandparents ver uh, versus all eight of your great-grandparents. So, so linking that to ancestry, uh, heritability, uh, genetics, those are completely different things. Now, there is some overlap, but if we're really thinking about how a person presents to the external world or how they view themselves, how they experience life uh, is very different from, from genetics. Now, I have no idea if there, if there are some actual genetic or genomic um, uh, variables or findings that, that will eventually link to uh, COVID-19, uh, but we, we shouldn't start with that as our hypothesis that what we we're seeing are, based on we the environment, don't we? We, right. we, we should not start with, place. it must be due to genetics. Uh, it must be due to ancestry because that is least likely to, to be the case, especially in this country when we're talking about people who identify as black and the amount of admixture that we, we bring to the table, um, that, that is much less likely to, to occur. But I do think an area where we have not studied enough is actually, um, you know, epigenetics. Mm -hmm. So right. what we're talking about with this um, chronic stress model, you know, changes in allostatic load, things that happen with your, with your body when you're experiencing uh, stress, um, there could be actually some uh, methylation changes, some epigenetic changes uh, that have an impact on your biophysiological response. Uh, but that is not due to um, something inherited in your genes, that's still due to the environment. And so um, sometimes we, we get stuck in the, it's this or that, and we don't look at the uh, the, the epigenetic or epigenomic response. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so Andre, right. can I just add, yeah, yeah, Jim, please. Can I just add one thing? So China has over a billion people and compared to many other countries, their genetics are, are fairly homogeneous compared to other places. And in China, if you had high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, if you smoked or had any other comorbid condition, seven out of 10 people who died of COVID-19 had at least one of those conditions. The point I'm making is the virus doesn't care what color you are. If your cells express the angiotensin converting enzyme number two, the virus will infect you. And if white people lived in multi-generational houses that were crowded, the virus would have rapidly spread through that, those households just like it did to brown and black families. So the only point I'm making is that from a biological point of view, a lot of this, these conversations, quite honestly, as a scientist, make absolutely no sense. That's, I just want to point that out. There you go. Thank you. That's You're beautiful. not talking about my conversation though, right? No, no, I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about you, though. No. You, you're, 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 you're spot on there. You're spot on. I want to come back to Nashville. And Bill, let's think about this neighborhood by neighborhood. Because the social determinants of health, in my mind, are the same social determinants of success in education. Yes. And, and as Consuelo pointed out, the, the property values, the property taxes, the investment of the city in Buchanan and Jefferson Street and D.B. Todd has been historically different than let's say West End or some of the neighborhoods in that area. And we do know that the same determinants of, of health influence your success vis-a-vis -vis education pathways. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Andre, um, education, uh, again, is one of those areas that COVID uh, shined a bright light on, but had sort of these pre-existing um, inequities that we all know about, but we haven't really uh, addressed. During the, the pandemic period, we learned a lot about what it means to provide equitable education when face-to-face -face time and traditional practices vanished. They disappeared. And this, in truth, has given us a lot of time. The, the K through 12, um, the pre-K, the higher education community to reflect and to, to think and to rethink education practices and how we should go about providing equitable education. And as we know, education outcomes are, are deeply connected to health outcomes. 
for the reasons that you said, all of these non-medical determinants that feed in, into that. Throughout the, the pandemic, equity gaps have gotten worse over the last 17, 15, 16, 17 months. They've gotten worse, those pre-existing gaps. And this investment of resources has the potential to recover the new investments that are coming in and accelerate learning that was lost during the pandemic. A lot of money is flowing from the federal and the state level. We wanna make sure that, that money is to used well. This new money that's coming in, this economic investment, we've, we've gotta be positioned to adopt the practices uh, that make up for that lost learning over the last 15 months and the lost quality in education uh, over the past year. And we need to close those equity gaps. And this is really true of uh, students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, students who face, as we mentioned earlier, the digital divide that prevents them from having some of the benefits from a virtual education when everything was shut down. Black students who are more than twice as likely as white students to be academically underprepared by the K through 12 system when entering higher education and Hispanic students who are the fastest growing student population in the state in particular deserve that, that attention. So I think as, as, we, as we come through this period where there's a lot more money, resources flowing, we in particular need to, lose, to look at these K through 12 uh, inequities that were pre-existing but made worse by the pandemic itself. That's great. No, definitely tied together. No question. Uh, I'm going to come back to Jim and Consuelo with questions uh, that I think really uh, the lay public needs to recognize that education around workforce diversity is a way to address some of the health equity issues. And I'd like you to talk about that, Jim, a little bit in terms of what you're doing at Meharry, but more importantly, what we need to do globally uh, through the AAMC and through all our medical schools. And then Consuelo following, tagging onto that after Jim, even with, with, within our predominantly white hospitals and medical institutions, we need more education around health equity. We've created a health equity certificate. Why is that relevant? Why is that important? How could that change some of the health outcomes of our patients later? Jim, you want to start off? Sure. So, uh, so thank you, Dr. Churchwell. One of the things that I'm really concerned about is the fact that there's such a low percentage of physicians and dentists and PAs and other healthcare providers who are from minority uh, backgrounds. And I'm particularly concerned about black males. The number of black men who are getting trained as physicians is not even close to what it needs to be. And that's been a problem for a long, long time. Um, but I think that our focus needs to be upstream. What I mean by that is that if you don't finish college, you can't go to medical school. If you don't finish high school, you can't go to college. And so what I'm saying is that we need to go all the way back to middle school and embrace those children and show them that these kinds of professions are possibilities for them. And if you look at the settings in which a lot of black and brown kids are getting their K through 12 education, it's not gonna be possible for them to have that attainment because the resources in those schools are not what they need to be. So I think that we have to make a massive investment in making sure that the educational attainment of of children from minority backgrounds can be the same as it is for, because as Dr. Friss pointed out, there's a huge gap. And until that gap is closed and these children can realize that these kinds of professions are possibilities for them, we're not gonna solve this problem. So we've adopted two middle schools here in Nashville and we're working on a model to do the same across the country because our medical students are rotating on a continual basis in multiple cities. So we have an idea to establish the same kind of partnerships with middle schools in those cities. So we're taking an upstream approach to this because we think that the pipeline is the problem. We got to fill the pipeline. And I think we need to start upstream. So it is a problem. And I think that's part of the solution is, is empowering children to believe and know that they can do this and not be intimidated by, by the science. Great, thanks, Jim. You know, uh, I just, attended my uh, alumni association meeting for Harvard Med School, Bill and I are Harvard Med School graduates. And there was a huge discussion about what predominantly white institutions and medical schools are doing around uh, their social justice. For, for Jim and at Mort Meharry, uh, Valerie Montgomery Rice at Morehouse and the president of Howard University and Drew Medical School, they don't have an issue. That is intrinsically part of their ethos, the social justice, moral, compass part, but predominantly white institutions have to have now, I, that is one of the 
if, if there's a side benefit of COVID is that that spotlight has been shown and the answer has been, uh, the call has been answered by some of the predominantly white institutions, one of which uh, is, is Vandy and Harvard too. Talk about that Consuelo as we begin to engage around our social justice and, uh, and racial justice thoughts. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm happy to share about the certificate in health equity that, uh, that we developed uh, a few years ago um, in response to what, uh, I, quite honestly, a response to the students. Uh, the students uh, were saying to the faculty um, at Vanderbilt, we're not, we're not learning enough about um, health disparities. We're not learning enough about how to address them. We're not learning about, enough about those root causes of inequities, those social determinants of health. Uh, and so they were basically knocking on our doors, or at least my door, often to say, when are you going to fix this? And, and so we, we came up with this, this new uh, I don't mind, but I sent them to your door because they get a better answer there. <laughs> well, well I, that's, what, that's why they were coming then. So there was a, a, pi, a, a line of students. Uh, and, and so we, we actually created this uh, certificate program. So at, at Vanderbilt, as, as, as in many other uh, medical schools, uh, when you're pursuing your um, doctor of medicine, you can have a concentration uh, where you get a certificate. And we have that in global health, we have it in, in several other areas. And so we created this certificate program that requires them to have some uh, foundational um, skills, knowledge and skills, and then they actually have to have some applied skills in health equity. So, so we created this, this program that goes over multiple years of of the MD program. So uh, they have to learn about concepts related to social and political determinants of health. They need to be able to identify upstream socioeconomic um, factors that, uh, that impact their health. And I certainly would say education um, is a, you know, one of those key determinants of health. Um, they, they need to understand the roles of, of history, power, privilege, prejudice, racism, structural racism. So these were actually already a part of, of our certificate in health equity program uh, several years ago when we created it. Uh, they need to understand issues around the impact of uh, linguistic competency, cultural humility, uh, health literacy. So, so we, you, we created this and, and really um, a, a key piece of that is uh, we bring in people from the community to teach this. Uh, and um, as you pointed out, um, historically black medical schools, minority serving institutions that have a lot of minorities on the faculty might not need to do that because they're, they have that bench to do it uh, internally, people with the lived experience, but we actually needed to bring in uh, people from the community, uh, individuals who work with um, uh, individuals experiencing homelessness, uh, people who uh, work in the, in the metro public school systems come and lecture our students. Uh, and that's really critical uh, for them to gain that knowledge. And then they have to apply it just as we do in, in our medical training um, later on with these immersions. They have to do research, they have to do QI projects. So we've been incredibly uh, proud of, of the students who, uh, as soon as it was approved, they also started knocking to say, we're ready, when do we start? Uh, you know, we went through the process to get it uh, approved by the provost, and I thought, oh, we have some time to create it. And they're like, no, we heard it was approved. When do we start? We want to start now. And so just uh, last month, we graduated our first cohort of 14 medical students uh, who graduated with their doctor of medicine and a certificate uh, in health equity. And they, they had to work overtime, extra time to, to really... Um, uh, do this work on an accelerated pace. And so I can't wait to see what they're going to do in the world. I think that's one of the, if you can think of a positive benefit in the, in the wake of the COVID, it is the, the, the clear accelerated interest of not just African-American students. And I think Consuelo actually didn't mention that. A lot of these are students of color, but, but Caucasian students, uh, Asian-American students. And it's just been really striking to see People picking up the picking up the baton and putting and put more putting their shoulders to the boulder of racism and health inequities. Uh, and not it is it's not just brown shoulders that are pushing those boulders. And you're seeing that happen and play out in our predominantly white institutions. But there's 
there's a whole gradient of that. Because not everybody's on page with that. And, and, and Meharry and Morehouse and other schools are certainly leading, leading us in that way. Um, I think though, Andre, if I, if I could just say, I think if we, if we take a step back and recognize that um, equity benefits all of us yes. uh, and, um, and move away from that zero sum game uh, mentality that in order for this group to be healthier, wealthier, right. uh, have this. better lives that I have to give up something and more towards if this group, if, if these individuals actually have better lives, more opportunities to thrive, then we as a society are actually thriving uh, and, and able to actually move forward together in a more meaningful way. And, and, and that model and that concept is why same thing about education as Bill was saying, if we have everyone achieving and reaching educational equity, which is another same force of equity we need to, to evaluate, then maybe the next uh, George Carver Washington that's over here in uh, North Nashville will actually come to Meharry and will solve cancer. So you know, that's really the purpose of, of uh, equity, whether it be health or educational. All boats rise, all potential, all human potential can be realized, despite your age, your race, etc. cetera. Andre, I'm, I want to jump in because I, I know our listeners, our audience are saying, well, I, equity, I'm all for it. Um, equality, yeah, you know, life's tough and it's not equal disparities. Yeah, Dr. Frist, I, I, I know you've got the data, but, you know, doesn't really apply to me. I just want to add two other things because I think Consuelo covered the structural racism very well. That there are policies in our community in Nashville and Tennessee and, and around the country that from a systems approach absolutely have to be addressed. And we've seen it play out, the discussion play out a lot over the last year independent of, in some ways, the pandemic, and, and going back to the sort of George Floyd discussion, but also the light rider uh, on it because of the pandemic. I, I am involved in a lot of discussions in the business community, the healthcare community, um, and people say, you know, what can we do? I just want to take it down to the personal level, not the structural racism, but the individual and the two things that I found interesting uh, in my conversations, number one, uh, Dr. Ruth Shem, who's professor of culture and clinical psychiatry at UC Davis, she sits next to me at, uh, on the board of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and she really helped me a lot. Um, and as I talk to people, when I share it to people um, a lot, and then she said, and, and I, I quote, I've got it, got it sort of written here as I go through, so I'm going to read it. And it has to do with bias, your own implicit bias. What does it mean? And she basically says implicit bias is in fact a neurobiological process in that we need it in order to survive. And this is all quote, humans cannot survive and function if they don't actually use the implicit bias circuitry that allows them to instantaneously assess if something is a threat or not. The problem is she writes, is as society has evolved, what is considered to be a threat takes on social and cultural meaning. So now we're at a place where our biases are telling us that certain people who are not threatening to us are in fact, very threatening. And, I, 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 and she closes and says, and we see the behavior and the actions that come from that. I say all that in quoted because implicit bias in some way is built into our, our neurobiological mechanism. And it's important to understand that because we all have it. We all have it. it. Doesn't matter the color of your skin, who you are. It just needs to be addressed where we are today and recognize what threat versus non-threat. So that's number one that helps people when I'm in a boardroom and I'm talking um, the sort of issues of equality and disparity. The second one, uh, Dr. David Williams also is on the board with me and you've heard talked about a, a lot today. And what he tells his students up front, and help, this helps me. He says, if you're a normal human being, a normal human being, you are probably prejudiced, whoever you are. You may not be racially prejudiced, but your, your stereotypes about fat people, about gay people, about old people, about women. And he, he concludes all that by saying, you know, it's a, a vulnerability that we all have whoever we are. And we got to keep thinking that because it makes us part of the human family. Those two issues, the fact that implicit bias is something we have to actively work over given facts and data, number one. And number two, we all are prejudiced. It's just, we need to talk about it. We need to discuss it. We need to uncover it. 
those two things are really helpful to me. And then I always conclude that where it's saying that we may not recognize all these unconscious decisions that are made that we wouldn't make them. As I said, every doctor and nurse doesn't come to work saying I'm going to be prejudiced. But the fact is, there is that sort of prejudice that's coming through. So if you're in a position today, if you're listening and you're out hiring people, you know, are you hiring people who just happen to look like you? It's implicit, but you just have to ask yourself, actively ask it. And if you're a, if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, or you're a clinician out there, are you being consistent? The data in Nashville says we're probably not being consistent, but ask ourselves, the doctor, are you prescribing and treatment processes consistent? I mean, lots of board meetings, that's kind of what I do these days in, in lots of ways. And if you're an executive, look at your board, just look at it and your leadership. And is it really representative of, of the people you, you serve? And, you know, the list can go on, but there are just things that all of us can be doing on a daily basis if we realize actively, based on these discussions, that we can make a difference. No, thanks. That's great. One of my closing two questions was around what can we do as individual Nashvillians? Okay. Bill just addressed it. I will add one other piece of information to that is that the mitigation process is best done by looking at who are your closest friends and your closest confidants. The five finger rule, if all of those people are from the same identity group, what, for me, all black men, you got work to do because the only way you're gonna deal with your unconscious or implicit bias is by actively, proactively, intentionally getting to know people who are different from you. That's why I got to know Bill Fritz. Get to know people who are different from you really well and be part of your inner circle. Otherwise, the, the issues around, as Bill said, the neurobiology is just running rampant and will keep you uh, opposed to accepting people in your med school or in your boards who, who, are, who look different from you and only look like you for that matter. As I close here, I've just got one. Well, if I could just add though, yeah. you know, in order to scale that, we still have to move to the systemic, to the institutional yeah. and societal level policies to make change. So we need to uh, recognize that bias at the individual level and be able to uh, make sure that we're examining our work so that it doesn't uh, impact those new policies. But also we need to, to start to think about how to dismantle, change, throw away those policies that are in place already that are perpetuating these these biases, whether and discrimination, racism, whether or not we are doing it actively in real time. Yes, yeah. whether that's voting rights issues or whether that's hospital privileges for physicians or a whole host of things like, like that that Consuelo is talking about. Well, we're getting close to time. I'd like to ask Jim Hildreth one question here. Can you think about Nashville as a city in the leadership that we have, as we look at trying to deal with health, health equity, you had a magic wand, what would you do? What would you do, Jim? Some of, some of what you're doing already in your position, for sure. Uh, well, Bill, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Churchill, what I, what I would do is to do some of what Dr. Fritz just said. It's time for some really difficult, challenging conversations about who we all are our approach to each other. And I've been focused on what I call culture humility lately, where we recognize that we can learn something from every person we interact with, if we can have that humility to allow ourselves to listen. And all of us bring value to the table. And I'm, again, I was so thrilled by the Nashville's response to, the, to this national public health crisis and watching these large organizations that to the best of my knowledge, had never cooperated on a level like this before. So that gives me great hope that we can, we can, we can do this, yes, but it's yes. gonna take some conversations that are difficult and challenging. And I think if we can do that, we're gonna be just fine. Thank you, Therese. Boy, I wanna thank my great friends and colleagues, uh, Consuelo Wilkins, Senator Dr. Bill Friss, uh, James Hildreth, phenomenal thought leaders, uh, scientists, and policymakers here, both in Nashville and, this, and, and the country as a whole. Thank them for sharing their knowledge, expertise, and time with us today. I hope this discussion has offered you some information and insights on some of the challenges we face as a society and our city to address the challenges of racial and ethnic health disparities in the time of COVID and beyond. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you, Andre. Great to be with you all.